Thank you very much, uh, Hannes, for the invitation. Um, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, when I accepted the invitation, uh, I, I was uh, a little bit hesitant at the beginning, and I was really thinking, what am I going to say about this topic? I'm working on this topic, but it's, uh, you have to approach it from a broader perspective. And then Hannes said, at some point, uh, there is freedom. And so I'm going to use the freedom as much as, I, as, a, as, as, uh, as you will see in order to, to put together my presentation in a way that essentially will go through the topic of uh, big science, but uh, in a variety of, uh, from a variety of angles and perspectives. And actually, I want to start uh, from one of the sectors where I think big science is mostly, uh, uh, say, used and uh, proved to be successful, the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, I took some notes uh, from uh, uh, Bayer, uh, a big pharmaceutical company, from molecules to medicine. And uh, actually, uh, I was uh, in, uh, surprised by the approach of, uh, uh, that was taken by medicine a long time ago, about 20 years ago, when the idea that they were uh, essentially pushing was in order to look for uh, uh, new drugs, uh, try all possible molecules in all possible ways. It's, it's a mechanism of doing big uh, things. So if you go through this, uh, let's say, uh, description of how Bayer builds his own uh, uh, drugs, huh? well, essentially you see that they start from the DNA, they start from looking at uh, proteins, how proteins are somehow regulated by, by genes, what can we do to turn uh, the genes on and off and therefore to, uh, let's say, change uh, the, the behavior of proteins. Uh, and uh, they, they do it essentially using experiments on, uh, on a low level uh, on the DNA or especially the, the kind of experiment that I mentioned are NA, RNA chips, which means to, to look at how the DNA translates to, 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 to create proteins. And then they start this massive uh, search. They have order of three million uh, uh, molecules that they can test against uh, the various uh, uh, let's say uh, possible targets and they do it using robots so the robots can, can load the order of thousands uh, um, uh, uh, molecules in order to, to test to field test uh, uh, so, so, the, so this, uh, this massive testing of 3 million molecules takes uh, just a few weeks which uh, is uh, remarkable eventually they may find candidate and at this point they can do also some uh, a computational study looking if the molecules uh, bind uh, well uh, to the, to the uh, particular proteins that they want to uh, affect. Uh, and uh, uh, it goes on and on. There are, there's a long uh, list of uh, phases through which uh, uh, drugs are established, including uh, uh, medical, uh, med 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 medicinal chemistry, pharmacological and toxicology, toxicology Galenics, how to package the, 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 the medicine together, testing whether the, the drug is uh, tolerable, confirming efficacy, efficacy, predicting effects on individuals, which is pharmacogenomics, and finally putting everything together. And here again, I, I, I took uh, some words from uh, this uh, description uh, because uh, uh, essentially all the information I just put together up to this point is amounts to orders of. Uh, uh, 33 gigabytes or 500,000 uh, uh, pages, that's what uh, the buyer says. So essentially, here again, is a problem of uh, managing a, a large amount of, in this case, documental data. Uh, I started like this because uh, recently I moved to biology, and so I think uh, it makes sense uh, to, to describe uh, the work which I've been doing as a computer science in the field, field of biology which is also a way to put my work in perspective of uh, the so-called big data or big science. Uh, so I'm taking liberty, I'm taking freedom. Huh? So I want to give you some ideas about where biology stands at this, in these days. Uh, we, we want to be multidisciplinary, so this is a, an opportunity. Uh, when, when there is a new technology which is called next generation sequencing, which has been able essentially to process DNA data very, very fast, essentially to read the DNA very, very fast. 
And uh, these uh, uh, phases of uh, work, let's say, in, in uh, next generation sequences, uh, essentially cover three phases of analysis. The first phase where you generate, uh, uh, let's say, the DNA reading. The second phase where you look for a feature from the DNA, and this feature can be uh, uh, variants, for instance, mutations. One thing that you need to do is to align all the information that you have according to some references, which essentially tell you how the genome, uh, give, give you an entire reading of the genome. And uh, once this is done, there are a number of additional things that you need to do, such as uh, 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 annotation, filtering of variants, uh, doing uh, uh, multi-sample processing, doing data aggregation, doing association analysis, uh, doing exploratory an an analysis. This is what is called tertiary analysis because it comes after these two processes of uh, first reading and then, let's say, extraction features from the DNA. And this is where I've been working in, in, in the last years. That is to say, more in the uh, problem point of, of uh, making sense of the data, huh? as opposed to extracting the data. And uh, there are a number of uh, existing repositories of uh, data w which uh, have been populated by consortia, where you can find a lot of information about uh, uh, genomic uh, information. Uh, and uh, there is also, uh, talking to the bio biologists, they say that a lot of information is uh, inside these uh, repositories there to be found, possibly by computer scientists, because uh, uh, I mean, there has been at the moment no uh, efficient, no, no effective uh, technique for uh, uh, discovering the data, the, the, the information which is hidden inside this data. So public data, public available, no problem in getting this information, and a lot of work in terms of uh, massive data analysis once we understand the problems. Understanding the problem is not easy. Uh, essentially, this is how you read the information which is uh, about genomics on uh, uh, tools which are called genome browsers, where essentially you see tracks, and these tracks uh, show some, uh, let's say, regularity. For instance, you can see that these are two tracks uh, and uh, there are peaks of expression, and the peaks relate to each other. So the two tracks are clearly related to each other, but how they are related? Why is uh, uh, one peak uh, higher or lower when the other one is also higher or lower? How, how this, this information relates to what, what this information hides? Uh, this is uh, to make uh, a concrete example of uh, what it means to search patterns, that is the, the long DNA. Uh, you may know that uh, the DNA bends. So when it bends, essentially pieces of the DNA, which are, uh, uh, let's say, on, on, on a linear scale, they are very far away, on a, on a spatial scale become close. And uh, these uh, are called loops of the DNA. They can now be uh, uh, plotted on, uh, on uh, on, uh, let's say, a scale. So it seems, it means that uh, this position and this position, which are far away, happens to be close. And, and the question that the people are, uh, are uh, uh, one of the questions that we are currently trying to answer together with biologists is how the 3D structure of the DNA influences uh, uh, the, the processes which, uh, which uh, occur in the DNA and essentially how uh, we can uh, uh, bring, uh, uh, let's say, if the 3D structure of the DNA brings uh, these uh, black uh, areas, which are called uh, uh, promoters, close to this uh, yellow area, which are called enhancers. Enhancers are essentially parts of the DNA whose uh, function is to turn on and off, to so switch on and off. Uh, 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 let's say the genes, or to, uh, uh, to as the term says, enhance their capability of, uh, of uh, 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 being uh, trans transcriptions. So this is, uh, and this is my last, uh, let's say, biological, uh, uh, let's say, uh, slide. Then I will turn to more, more uh, uh, to m closer to the topic. But just to, to give you an idea what uh, what this means, well, we have uh, this. Uh, area which are called uh, 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 promoters, which stay insta insta inside the genes. We have these other areas which are called enhancers, which stay far away from the genes, but somehow 
the DNA bands, and uh, when the DNA bends, uh, this enhancer comes close to the, to, the, to the promoters. Now, the enhancer emits some uh, substance, which are this, uh, 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 essentially these uh, 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 activators, and at the same time, this uh, promotes the binding of the, of the, of the DNA, and once uh, this activator comes close uh, to other uh, substances, which are called mediator, they can attach, and at this point, uh, the enhancer is put in, uh, in connection with, the, with the, uh, the gene, and the transcription occurs at a at the, at the faster speed. So how this is a problem of, of data? Well, essentially, you know, all of this information is uh, stored somewhere in, in repositories. If you have the good languages and the good tools, uh, you could essentially turn uh, this problem into a quote-unquote big data problem. That is to say, express it using some uh, uh, language uh, formalism. And this is what we have been doing. Essentially, we have been inventing a, a language by means of which it is possible to go to the repositories or to the experiments to extract this information and to process it in a way that this uh, biological uh, question can be answered. And here I'm just giving you, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very quick, uh, and, uh, and I don't really pretend to be, uh, let's say, uh, more than, than just giving you a vision. But essentially, it is possible by means of this uh, expression to extract the promoters, uh, selecting them from, from things which we call annotations. It is possible to uh, uh, find where the peaks uh, of the enhancer, uh, let's say, essentially uh, uh, are, are overlapping. It is possible to uh, look at the, at the particular uh, uh, loops uh, in the genomes. It is possible to uh, find uh, this particular area which are called uh, mediators. It is possible to uh, join uh, these loops uh, with uh, the signals. It is possible to count uh, how many uh, of these uh, uh, promoters we find in the areas. Eventually, it is possible to give a quantitative description of the, uh, of the complicated phenomena which I've shown to you. Uh, how this has been done? Well, essentially, it has been done by inventing a language. What is this language doing? It's essentially, it's just recovering good old uh, database management uh, languages, so operations, essentially, on top of genomic data, which has been modeled uh, in a way in which uh, it is possible to apply these uh, abstractions to genomics. And uh, there are, these abstractions are very classical, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about uh, data management, but there are some uh, domain-specific operations which are used uh, to do the operation which are good uh, in this specific uh, uh, environment. And uh, we have been uh, implementing this, uh, say, language in, in two versions. We are close to finishing version two uh, on, on cloud uh, systems. And we have also been uh, able to, to, let's say, uh, retrieve and, uh, and, and reformat in our in our structure, uh, in, our, in our model, uh, uh, data from ENCODE, TCGA, epigenomic roadmap, which are three of the, of the main repositories which give you this information. And these are references. If, if anybody of you is interested, just uh, this, this language is called genometric because we, we, we compute distances. And you can just put GMQL on Google and you find uh, essentially the information about, about it. And uh, we also ended up using uh, this uh, language as, a, as a, let's say, um, a framework in which we, we are testing a different implementation. So at the moment, we, have, we, are, we are comparing implementation with, of uh, two main frameworks, which are called uh, Flink and Spark. And uh, we, we, we will uh, describe uh, how the two uh, frameworks compare when applied to uh, genomic application. Back to the topic. This was a long digression, but just to show that I am doing some work in big data. So uh, the, the, when we, we came to the uh, topic, uh, essentially we have to compare uh, two, uh, two approaches, the so-called format versus complete, uh, and the so-called uh, big science. The formal and complete approach essentially uh, says the following, that uh, we have models and we should follow the models. 
models uh, can be tested. Test, uh, after testing, we have experiments. Experiment can falsify or, or, or confirm the theoretical model. Uh, we are trained to understand that uh, uh, correlation is not causation, that no conclusion can be drawn on based on correlation, that the data without the model is just noise. This has been, uh, the, let's say, the uh, approach that has been given to, the, to, to computer science up to the time when the uh, big science or data-driven approach has been established. If we take it to the extreme, the big science approach says uh, uh, correlation is enough. If you have petabytes of data, uh, essentially you can uh, uh, stop looking for models. Uh, I took this uh, quote from uh, Chris Anderson, uh, editor-in-chief of Wired. Of course, this is not uh, a scientific quotation. Huh? But uh, uh, I think it's important to establish uh, the current uh, standing of the discussion. What it says is that uh, we can analyze the data without hypothesis. We can throw numbers into the biggest computing cluster in the world and let statistical library find patterns where, where the science cannot. So in a sense, uh, what is this uh, proposal saying? Uh, we can forget about the models. We can uh, uh, do as the pharmaceutical companies do take uh, uh, three millions of, uh, of uh, molecules into account, uh, try, field test them against possible candidates, look at which candidates uh, give us a good result, and that's it. We, we find the drug. We can do it in, in pharmaceutical, uh, uh, let's say, research. We can do it in anything. Uh, I'm very glad to be the first one to talk, because uh, so Moje will be able to, uh, to expand on this. I, I've seen uh, from his abstract that he's uh, saying the, 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 the data-driven approach does not replace the formal model approach. And in, in his approach, uh, actually, the data-driven approach stands on the shoulder of the model. The question is how many Moshe Vardi are around us. So one in this particular case. But the question is how much uh, can this, uh, his experience uh, of uh, uh, putting data-driven science uh, on top of models be, be followed. And I let this uh, to the next presentation. But Moja, I'm sure, will tell you more about this. When did all start? Uh, they started with uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, book, uh, The Fourth Par uh, Paradigm. Uh, and I think it started from Jim Gray's work. I, I, I have the pleasure to show you a very old uh, picture of the two of us. So, of course, the one uh, below is me. But the other one is Jim, and uh, I have been uh, knowing him uh, for, uh, I don't know, uh, you, you, you can tell from the, from the photograph, it's a long time ago. And uh, Jim Gray was really a visionary, and he was really uh, ahead of us in many, in many respects. I remember when he, when he told, uh, I'm now working with astronomers, and I said, come on, you are uh, an established computer science, how can you spend your, your time uh, in, in, in so specific disciplines. And he said, no, 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 no. Uh, this is the, the way in which, which computer science should go. Huh? This is where computer science should go. Go deep in science uh, together with scientists. Uh, why the fourth paradigm? Because there is a sequence of paradigms in which uh, computer science has been evolving from empirical science and observation to theoretical science and mathematically driven inside, to computational science and simulation driven inside, to data driven inside of other scientific research. So this is what, and this is taken from the, let's say, the uh, presentation of the fourth uh, paradigm uh, book. So essentially, fourth paradigm, because it, pu it is pushing uh, data driven uh, aspects. Uh, I look back into what uh, Jim Gray was saying in this book, uh, actually in a um, presentation uh, that uh, was uh, written uh, by collecting some of the speeches. And uh, well, uh, from the point of view of data, which is where I come from, uh, there is a problem that uh, the data should be well described, should be self-described, should be to give a, a good description of what they mean. Uh, uh, if you have a, a schema, eh, you can talk about the genes and their properties, the stars and their properties, the galaxies and their properties. If you just have uh, 
what, what he says a bunch of files, that is to say unstructured information, then essentially you are unable to do uh, uh, much. But if you have a schema, you can index the data, you can aggregate the data, you can use parallel search, you can have a dot queries. It's much easier to visualize. By the way, this is what has been driv driving me in, in, the, in the research which I have uh, been showing to you. Giving a schema to the information, then being able to combine heterogeneous information and to make sure that it is possible to extract information. So, uh, a, a small digression about uh, what it means to designing big data. Uh, well, uh, uh, along Jim, the big data should have some structure and a, and a minimal level of description. They should be self-describing. They should be of sufficient quality. But uh, uh, to some extent, uh, it is very difficult to achieve this result because in many, many cases, big data uh, are produced uh, bottom-up. They exist. They essentially come out uh, from, uh, uh, let's say, measurements. Uh, uh, they typically are, uh, let's say, hard to integrate because there is no common, let's say, uh, denominator, no common uh, uh, descriptions that can uh, actually be used to integrate them. Uh, so, uh, typically, it is in difficult to go in the way in which we have been uh, training students to, to do conceptual models, to do, uh, uh, and on the other end, that, uh, doing that integration is very hard. So, in, in my view, huh, a big data approach to some extent uh, is uh, 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 such that the theory and abstraction of uh, data management are losing ground. And to some extent, this is also interesting to say that the new uh, uh, collection of systems are called NoSQL database. This is just to, 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 to improve the fact that there is no need for certain kind of exceptions. Uh, this conference is about education, so I, I take an angle of looking into educational issues. So, uh, if you look at uh, what is happening in, in around uh, uh, big science, uh, it seems that uh, a new educational model of big science is emerging. This model is uh, very much pushing mathematical and statistics, data mining, machine learning as a as kind of a foundational uh, um, disciplines. It is problem driven, and. Uh, the, it looks like uh, the traditional computer science models are used if they are needed, but they are not really the key foundational aspect of the curriculum. Uh, I looked into a particular program, which is the Master of Science in Computational Science and Engineering, which is offered at Harvard. By the way, we are, we are at the moment building a program together with Harvard uh, uh, on uh, seeing how to put some students at work on, uh, on uh, uh, this along, along the, the, these directions. And uh, as, if you look at what a graduate student of this problem should be able to do, you find uh, a lot of things which have to do with uh, computational aspects. Uh, evaluate multiple computational approaches to problem and choose the most appropriate one. Produce a computational solution that can be comprehended and used by the other. So it is important to be able to uh, communicate and this uh, comes across uh, very clearly, communicate across disciplines, collaborate within teams, uh, uh, model system with uh, consideration of efficiency, cost, and available data. There's also another emphasis on, uh, on being able to uh, use computation for repro reproducible data analysis and going uh, to uh, parallel distributed computing, building software and artifacts which are robust, reliable, and maintainable enable breakthroughs in the specific domain. So, this is what uh, computational science and engineering has been defined to be. Uh, there are a few programs which are uh, coming up uh, in the universities. I looked into it, Italian university, but there are, I'm sure, other similar programs. Uh, they are called uh, programs in big, in big data, or programs in big science. Most of them are problem driven. This first time the problem then choose the method. Uh, of course, they have uh, computational aspects in, in, in the program, machine learning and statistical methods. 
But they also have other, other features. A business orientation, uh, what is the enterprise value for this, uh, for this big, big, big data analysis? And also something which is becoming popular, which is called storytelling, how to present the data. Not just visualizing, also how to understand the story which is behind the, uh, the data. So one of the point, but we will have uh, maybe more, more, ish, more, more time to discuss it uh, with uh, Moshe later on. I don't see a lot, a lot of uh, room for uh, models in this particular, let's say, short one-year uh, masters which are offered and they're becoming very popular in big data. Uh, going to the, how we could, uh, let's say, uh, describe uh, big data skills. Well, I, I took a few uh, visual descriptions from, from the web because I, I did my, my uh, homework of trying to prepare for this uh, presentation. So, uh, well, first of all, data science is seen uh, as a, as a, as a let's say, confluence of abilities which are called uh, hacking, which we could really term uh, deep programming, uh, substantial expertise, which we could uh, uh, reframe as uh, uh, domain expertise, and mathematical and statistical knowledge. Uh, you see that uh, traditional research is placed somewhere where the expertise about the domain meets with mathematical and statistical knowledge. Machine learning is uh, seen uh, at the conference between uh, mathematics and statistics and hacking. A dangerous zone is where hacking is applied to uh, application without really being able to, uh, let's say, be, being critical. And if you are lucky to have the, the three, let's say, components, then you are essentially uh, going along data science, that's okay, producing data science. There is another figure which is becoming uh, popular. Uh, the, this is a figure of the pie shape. So uh, maybe you have seen it before. So the, the, the point is that uh, up to some point, uh, some, some time ago, uh, it was uh, considered to be healthy to have uh, a so-called T shape. That is to say a vertical expertise and then uh, an horizontal expertise on, uh, uh, let's say, um, horizontal expertise has essentially to do with uh, what are called soft skill, ability to, to present, ability to work in, uh, together, or ability to, to uh, say, essentially uh, be efficient in a, in a team. Uh, now, uh, the, there is also this uh, pie shape which is uh, coming up where in addition to domain speciality, in addition to horizontal skill, it, would, it is also uh, important to have uh, statistical and, co and computing abilities. And somehow this is uh, going in the same direction as, as we were saying before. A data scientist could be one that uh, is able to combine domain speciality and statistical and computing uh, uh, abilities. Uh, there has been some discussion about whether uh, data science uh, is recognized, is academically recognized. Uh, I look back, and again I did my homework, I looked into the, into the um, uh, web discussions, and uh, it appears that uh, it is difficult for the deep uh, data scientist to be very successful in academia. Uh, a deep data scientist, one that does it well, essentially has to uh, produce uh, uh, very good uh, software, be expert in very many domains, be interdisciplinary, which is always very difficult, as uh, I can tell you after three years of experience of genomics. Uh, uh, and uh, the time spent in uh, producing high quality reusable software tools, uh, which are essentially the ones that are, are used for data science, uh, translate to less time to write and publishing, which uh, translate to less uh, uh, possibilities for academic career. Uh, there was also a post which was saying, okay, but the data scientists, after all, do not need to stay in, in academia. They can go to industry. If they go to industry, they have much more. They have a salary, they are opportunities of advancement, respect of peers. They have opportunity to work in open software, because, uh, open problems, because academia is uh, uh, essential, uh, because in, in industry you find uh, opportunities. 
uh, opportunity to travel, opportunity to publish, or also the freedom from the burden to publish, opportunity to teach, or also the freedom from the burden of teaching, opportunity of mentor student, or freedom for the burden of mentor and student. There are many positions in uh, industry where a data scientist essentially can uh, combine with uh, uh, universities and get uh, all these goodies without really being uh, uh, doing an academic research, uh, a career. Uh, so there was a call for fixing the value system to defend uh, the data scientist career, which uh, I think are good, uh, uh, good uh, principles that uh, may apply in general in our, in our area, but they particularly apply if people dedicate to this multidisciplinary data science. Press, uh, press the importance of reproducibility, uh, reproducibility, that is to say, make sure that the results can be reproduced. Push for a new standard for tenure track evaluation, which, which uh, would uh, essentially value more the, uh, the results uh, when they have, uh, 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 let's say, a sound, uh, practical, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, impact. Uh, create uh, and fund position which emphasize and reward uh, uh, open cross-disciplinary scientific software tool. Also, uh, one point was to increase the pay of postdocs uh, in order so that they can best, better compete with uh, industry. Uh, there was also discussion where, where we should, we should data science be. Uh, it is possible that each department develops its own data science uh, groups. It is possible that it, it becomes part of the applied computer science. Uh, some people advocate the idea that there should be a consulting services within university, which is not essentially giving a high ranking to the discipline. Uh, or uh, they, there are other opinions by means of which uh, data science is a natural location of interdisciplinary studies. Uh, there is also someone who says, okay, now in the past you had uh, books, libraries, and you have to take care of books. Now we have data, and you have to take, their, take care of data. So there is uh, a new role of the data scientist as, as someone who is uh, capable of doing data curation. Okay, so uh, I come more or less uh, close to the conclusion of my talk. Uh, I want to broaden a little bit the spectrum of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, broadening from big science means really to broaden, <laughs> go, go, go much further, and uh, say something about computer science education and beyond. Uh, where do we stand? Uh, my opinion, computer science is uh, growing uh, beyond the 10 years ago decline. There was a time 10 years ago when uh, uh, it, it looked as if uh, computer science were essentially going down. Uh, now it is not the case. Uh, there is a, a, a stable trend of growth, uh, hopefully. Uh, lots of undergraduate and graduate students, lots of jobs, lots of positions to be filled. Uh, it's, still not, it's still not very popular if you talk about uh, computer science with uh, young uh, people. Uh, the brightest high school graduates still think that uh, essentially computer science is uh, just uh, populated by, by nerds. Uh, we could be self-referential in computer science. We have uh, enough models, methods and technologies that belong to computer science that we, could, uh, we can uh, use. So, so why changing? Why we should not be self-referential? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I think the current chal challenge of computer science is really to meet multidisciplinarity. It's really to meet, uh, uh, to face the, 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 the challenge, but we have to do it uh, uh, standing rather than, than leaning. What I mean by that, uh, for instance, in my relationship with uh, uh, this uh, Institute of Oncology, where I've been working with in the last three years, essentially they looked at computer scientists as someone who could solve their problems and not to, let's say, peers to which you can describe your own, the, 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 uh, the problem that you have so that they will come up with uh, a new set of solution which can, at the same time, enrich, uh, the, let's say, the science not only from, uh, say, uh, 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 the, the, the discipline of, uh, 
of biology, but also from the viewpoint of, uh, of computer science. So standing instead of leaning, which means uh, essentially being able to defend uh, uh, the, the position of computer science as a science. And uh, I think that we have uh, an advantage compared to other disciplines, that is to say that we are uh, radically, we can be radically problem, problem driven. And this can happen at all possible levels, including in the small, where we taught just a teach uh, uh, two hour semester of programming 101. Still, we can do it by being problem driven, just by, by showing what, what, uh, what computer science can do to solve real problems. And in the large, when you have a, a breadth of a one, two year curriculum, we should be more program driven. Okay. And my last 10 minutes, eh, which I, I, I'm, I time it so that there are only 10 minutes, eh, and, and Hannah says me five, but yeah, I think of that. Okay. Uh, what I did in the last years, uh, Hannes has, uh, has introduced me as a director of Alta Scuola Politecnica. Well, I've been working not only in uh, genomics, but also in innovation. And uh, this book, which I received yesterday, the first uh, copy from uh, uh, Springer, and actually is, a bound, is, is manually bound, so it's not yet uh, a, a, a printed copy, is about uh, uh, changing direction in education, creating education leaders. Uh, what, what is this? This, first of all, came out of uh, uh, an experience together with Alta Scuola Politecnica and together with uh, uh, Benny Banerjee, who is, uh, uh, was director of the D school at Stanford. We, we, we actually involved in, in D school at Stanford. We, we created a group of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, which has been discussing issues of education. In, in uh, an event which was uh, uh, held uh, tw uh, for, uh, two times in Como in 2013, uh, uh, 12 and 13. And uh, essentially the idea was that uh, we wanted to recognize uh, which are the common features of uh, a variety of schools which exist uh, in the world, uh, which are uh, uh, trying to develop uh, uh, additional education along the dimension of the, of the horizontal dimension of the, of the T. And particularly, we were, uh, uh, let's say, involved, uh, in, well, the, the topic of leadership is one, but in general we were involved in, in interested in how to uh, develop uh, interdisciplinary education. And uh, 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 the, the leadership is really, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, in the new model of leadership, what you really want to do is to, to uh, express your leadership in a way that is not hierarchical, but is more multimodal. And it is something where the person who, who lives in the groups and is, has, a, has the responsibility of leading the group has, has a, to, must have be able to uh, catalyze, uh, uh, let's say, the um, uh, energies, uh, frame and vision, uh, drive transformation, inspire and so on. So we try to understand which are the characters of the new leaderships uh, which are uh, proposed by these uh, uh, schools. And uh, we also try to, to, to frame what it means to be innovative and it means to move from uh, concrete to abstract and the pro from the problem to the solution space. Uh, this figure reminds me of something that we learn in, uh, in the software cycles, but it is more about uh, uh, how to uh, move uh, from, let's say, from the initial insight to the problem definition, definition to the solution generation and, and its definition. And uh, there are some implications on education. Uh, uh, we would like the university to become more learning-centric, uh, the, to add to the expertise of the discipline, also the capability of being, uh, to integrate knowledge uh, uh, to, to learn how to, uh, to uh, work together. Uh, the instructor could uh, drive the student during the knowledge integration process. Uh, there are also new pedagogical models of, uh, of how to instruct students. Uh, and, and the key ingredients include uh, soft knowledge, such as uh, collaboration, decision-making, leadership. Uh, this is a 
uh, a map in the, of the institutes in the world which have uh, cooperated to this effort. Essentially, we have uh, uh, one in the, in, the, in the Far East, Tangier University, uh, four in, in, in North America, Stanford University with this school, uh, Cumber College of Philadelphia University, the School of Engineering and Applied Science, which is the one which I mentioned before at Harvard, uh, uh, a master in design and strategic foresight and innovation in, in Toronto. And then we have uh, several uh, European uh, um, schools, and in particular the Alta Scuola Politecnica in Milano, but also the EIT, ICT Lab uh, Master School, which is uh, an interesting uh, European project where the student essentially uh, take a master by joining two universities and in the master the, the, the aspect of uh, let's say um, uh, business orientation, T-shaping, uh, uh, leaderships are, uh, are very much uh, emphasized. And there are uh, also participating uh, other institutions in Brighton, in, in Paris and in, uh, in the Imperial College. Well, these are the key words which are uh, have been uh, shared by, by uh, if you look at the various, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, manifestos of the various schools. Uh, interdisciplinarity is really strong. So if you look at uh, the number of disciplines which appear in each of the schools, uh, uh, there are quite many. And, uh, including, uh, uh, well, it's very hard to read, but including uh, architecture, design, engineering, uh, uh, human sciences. Uh, uh, I mean, and, and the point is that some of the school really recruit their students from all possibilities. For instance, the D school is a traversal program at the, at the, at the uh, say, graduate level where the students, they, they don't have their own students. The students join these programs coming from the various departments and they, they essentially join this, the, this program in order to perform uh, uh, activities, uh, innovation activities, uh, solve uh, concrete problems, being divided in teams. And many of the colleagues in the computer science department uh, at Stanford are actually taking active uh, role in, in, in some of these projects. Uh, it, it is strongly program based. Also, the, 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 the amount of uh, the, the, the area uh, is an indication of uh, how long are, are these projects. So, th the projects can be rather short in terms of uh, duration. They can just uh, be very short and effective, or they can be uh, broader as a uh, number of, uh, of uh, say, lectures and, and courses. The emphasis is uh, on uh, problem setting and idea generation more than on uh, solutions. Uh, I already mentioned the, the calling for a new model of leadership and everything is placed in a, in a contest where institution play the role, government plays the roles, uh, industry three plays the roles, uh, there is a stronger community and so the, there is an ecosystem which is, uh, which is uh, playing uh, uh, an important role for, for all of this uh, uh, organization. And I understand that also in Vienna there is something uh, very similar that will be interesting to compare. And the most important aspect of, uh, of uh, this, of an ecosystem are the people. Here I have uh, uh, Sergei Brin in front. And uh, lots of people which have been participating to research at the Stanford University, which is, by the way, one of the places which I uh, used to collaborate and go very often. And you may recognize someone there, and I'm sure that uh, Moses already recognized his face that on, on, uh, on, the on the left corner. And so uh, the, the ecosystem of people is really what uh, makes uh, uh, a community uh, strong. So I think uh, the call for making this community more stronger also, uh, let's say, uh, is uh, 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 this, 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 this picture shows that it is good to be in, a, in an ecosystem of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, characters, of strong characters. So, uh, this being said, I leave the, the podium to Moshe. I'm sure it will be more to the topic than I have been. 
but I, I've taken all the, all the freedom that I was uh, capable of, uh, of uh, getting in my talk. Thank you very much. I don't know if this was the plan, but this will come up nicely as a point counterpoint type of uh, session. So you can see from the title that uh, I tend to be a little more skeptical of the hype that we generate to the outside world. This is the kind of general theme of my talk. So in uh, 1962, a remarkable book by, published by a philosopher Thomas Kuhn called The, the Structure of Scientific Revolution which is a nice connection, in fact, to Vienna, because this was part of a, of a series of books, and the editor was Rudolf Karnap, who was part of the Vienna circle here. And uh, that probably is the best-known books about philosophy of science, and introduce a, a phrase, the paradigm shift, that now has become almost a cliche. And the perception and the picture you get from, from Thomas Kuhn is that uh, every so often there is a revolution in science, and you throw away the old paradigm, and you bring a new paradigm, and the old paradigm is completely discarded, and we have a new paradigm. And you want to think of the, the Ptolemaic system for understanding planetary movements, and the, the Copernican model, okay? You throw away the old model, bring a new model. But if you talk to, to really a scientist with deep understanding of, of science history, they tell you that this is actually the exception rather than the rule. Most of the time, especially since we started, since the Enlightenment in the 17th century, we don't throw out old science, we keep it. New science refine old science. You want to go to the moon? You don't, use, you don't need to use general relativity. Old, good old Newtonian mechanics is good enough to go to the moon. It's good enough to go to Mars, because this, the, the, the relativistic effects are so tiny they will have no impact. If you want to understand a big bank, yes, then you need to worry about general relativity. So my thesis is that this is really what's happening. The, the field is evolving, and data science does refine what I would call formal science, but it doesn't throw it out. And I will become more technical now because I want to give two examples. I kind of reflected what I've been doing in the last 30 years of my own research. So. So I spent my youth doing database theory, and uh, uh, the big bang in database theory was a paper by Ted Code in 1970 that introduced relational databases. And the idea there, as Stefano mentioned, first of all, you have a fixed schema. You start designing your databases by creating a, a, a model for the enterprise. What do you need to have, okay? Employee department, department manager, you build your, your database schema, and then you have a language, which is really a fantastic success story of, of computer science, the first declarative language, really serious, successful declarative language. And essentially, and if you look at Ted Codes, where it comes from, it comes from logic. So you can think of SQL essentially as syntactically sugar first order logic. And so that was through, a, and there was a huge fight during the 70s, it was called, became known as the relational worlds. But eventually, relational, relational model became successful. And in 82, I believe, uh, Ted Code, 81 or 82, Ted Code received already, within 10 years, he received the Turing Award. But by, by the late 70s, people realized that, that first order logic is too weak to express many properties, and advocated adding recursion. And this came independently from people that came from mainstream database theory, Eho and Ullman, or people came from uh, logic programs, and indeed, in 1999, SQL3 added recursion as part of SQL. The most popular way that you, that you, you if you see recursion in uh, SQL is via a language that's been popularized by Meyer and Warren as Datalog. And you may remember the, the logic program, the Japanese fifth generation, another way of enormous hype. But out of this, we got a very nice formalization of adding recursion by means of rules. So the, the, the obvious example to see, if you want to formalize the concept of transitive closure in graph, path in graphs, then you say there is a path between x and y, if, this is, read it as if, if there is an edge from x to y, or there is a path from x to y, 
if there is a pass from X to some Z, and then a pass from Z to Y. And not, it's not difficult to see that these two words capture everything you, you need to know about path in graphs. And this is really what we call here path doubling. You double the length of the path. Or people come up with another, uh, these are kind of a amusing example that X buys Y if X is trendy and someone buys Y or if X likes Y. This is a, a more amusing example. So data log has been, become a language that people have now studied in many, many settings. And in fact, become now popular in declarative networking. There turned out to be very nice work to, in software-defined networking, people are using versions of data log. Now in database theory, uh, a question of tremendous importance is query optimization. And the idea is you're given a query queue, and you want to replace it by another query queue prime that is equivalent to it, but is easier to execute in some sense. And this is really the whole idea of also of program optimization. You replace a program by an equivalent one that executes better. Now, this can be formalized in, in the concept of query containment. We said that Q1 is contained in Q2 if whenever you apply Q1 to database B, it is contained in the result of applying Q2 to the, to, to the same database. And this is useful because clearly equivalence means that the two things are contained in each other. And therefore, going back to the late 70s, people identify query containment as really one of the most fundamental uh, database, database problems. When you reason about you want to do query optimization, you need to reason about query containment. When is one query containing another query? Except that this is a difficult problem, actually. So for, for SQL, query containment is undecidable. And that comes fairly easily. In fact, I mean, it's very, very even hard to, to find a, a reference for this because it comes from the fact that, as you, as you know, one of the main the first results, so to speak, in theoretical computer science was already in the 30 but Turing showing that the decision problem for first order logic is unsolvable. So it's undecidable to reason about first order logic because SQL is essentially first order logic, even query containment is already too difficult. And as a result, for general SQL, we don't have a good theory, and we don't have good practice of optimization. Again, don't believe what you hear from all the vendors. The reality is for full SQL, queue optimization is very, very poor in general. On the other hand, there is a fragment which we call SPJU for Select, Project, Join, Union. And these are basic constructs in, in a database query. You don't, it's not important that you know the details of this. But for this class of queries, we have two things. Uh, first of all, we have a very good theory. We understand that this has been studied. This is well understood. And indeed, for this class, we have very good practice. This is where database engines shine is in optimizing these kind of queries, not in general SQL queries. It so happens that indeed, the vast majority of queries fall into this class. So if you can optimize them well, you do well on the vast majority of your queries, and on a small minority of queries, don't expect good, good performance from the database. I want to give you an example. I want to just, again, by means of rules, you say that X and Y are part of a triangle. There is an edge from X to Y, an edge from Y to Z, and an edge from Z to X. But I have two edge relations. The fact that I have two rules means I'm taking the union. So each one, and I won't get into detail, this is really, there is, these are all examples of select project join union queries. And you write it in terms, you see these are in terms of data log rules. So for S, select project join union, we do have good theory and practice. What about data log? So adding recursion, and recursion you have, again, here you can see we have recursion because path is defined in terms of path. This is, this is what makes it recursive. So adding recursion is enough to make it undecidable. And this is not very difficult to see because you almost see the similarity between these rules and uh, context-free grammars. Very classical, old-fashioned topic, but from the formal era of, uh, of computer science. And you may remember that, uh, that containment for context-free language is undecidable. So indeed, for full data log, we don't have a good theory and practice of query optimi optimization. It's just too difficult. 
And so people have been trying to find good fragments of this language for which we can do a good reasoning about query containment. And so the question is, okay, data log is select progenitor on union plus recursion. Can we limit recursion to recover this ability? This has been a, a big question, and for many years it was really no serious success, no, no good success. Then we went into the era of big data, and in, database, in, in the database era, we went into big data already in the 90s, not in the 2000s, but already in the 90s, because we suddenly had a lot of sources of data that did not conform to the old model of you have a fixed schema. This came from the web and from SGML and library catalogs and XML and metadata. And so all this situation, we don't have a fixed schema. So a new model arose that allowed to not have a fixed schema, and that's called graph databases. And what is a graph database? Well, it's, a very, it's almost a, a, in the most simple model you can imagine. You have a set of nodes, and you have a set of edges, and the edges are labeled. This is it. This is what we call edge label graph. Now, why not to have node labels? Actually, you could have them, but edge labels are more general than node labels. Just this can be shown formally. And, but the point, important point is there's no fixed schema. The set of labels is not fixed in advance. Here is an example of what you typically see as a graph database. You see nodes. Here you have node labels as well. And this uh, identify people and the relationship between them. And the set of names is not fixed in advance. And the set of relationship is not fixed in advance. And a big question arose already in the 90s. OK, what is the right query language for this structure-less data, for this schema-less data? And you may have heard the phrase no SQL. No SQL is a big, again, is a big marketing term. But part of it is how do we query stru structures that uh, uh, data that, does, that do not have this nice structure of, of relational databases. And one thing that comes up in all, and there are many, many languages, and one thing that is common to all of them, that we're interested in paths between elements. And these are going to become known as path queries. So you can think that to write a path query, I'll write a rule QXY if X and Y are connected by some language L. And this is a formal language over the labels. So the idea is if you have A and B and there is a sequence L1 to LK, then A and B are in the answer if, the, if this word is in the language. And in particular, usually we, we, we often write these languages by means of regular expressions. So here is a query. You say X connected to Y if X and Y are connected by the following sequence of labels, wing, a non-empty sequence of parts and not. So you could think about it that Y is a not which is somewhere shows up in a, in a particular wing of a plane, airplane, for example. So these are called regular path queries. So it turns out that regular path queries can be viewed again as a fragment of data log. Why? Because of what you should remember about regular, ex regular expressions, they have concatenation union and clinic closure or transitive closure, and all of this can be expressed in data log. So this is concatenation, EXY if E1XZ and E2ZY. Having two roles means that we have a union, and we already saw, show, saw how to do transitive closure. So regular path queries are a fragment of data log. So now the question is, can we, can we reason about path queries? And in particular, we want to do containment between two path queries. And so suppose we have two queries, one defined in terms of language L1 and one defined in terms of langu language L2. It's very easy to see that the containment holds exactly when you have containment between the languages. Why? Because suppose you have A connected to B by a sequence, a word L1 to LK, that if this is in L1, it also must be in L2, and therefore the word must be in L2. And therefore, for these queries, query containment is just like language containment. And again, all the classical result about, about language containment, it's undecidable for context-free languages, but it's decidable can be done in polynomial space for regular path queries. So now we get classical result from automata theory, and they give us a 
containment, and this actually, even though it's piecewise, can be implemented fairly efficiently, we can uh, check con chain containment for regular path queries. And this is really only initial result, and now a sequence of people have kind of explored how much can you extend it? How far can you go, extend the language, get richer reasoning about path in graphs, and still retain containment, retain the ability of containment? So the first step was we would like for every relationship also to explore the inverse of the relationship. So if part x, y means that y is part of x, then part sub minus would simply reverse the relationship. And this enables you to define interesting relationships. So take, take the concept of half-sibling, which is sharing one parent. Not two, but only one parent. You can actually take the, the transitive closure on that, because somebody can be half-sibling by means of one parent, and then that could have another half-sibling by means of another parent, and actually that can, can go on. If the, if the family relationships are complicated enough, you can have a very long chain of half-sibling. So I call it a, oops, half, half star, half star sibling. And you can define it by means of this kind of expression where I say, father minus, which is go from the, from the child to the father, back to the child, or up the mother axis, back to the mother, and then take the, the closure of this. And again, using automata rotate technique, this can still be shown to be decidable in polynomial space. And then people ask, well, wait a minute, can you extend it? And so if you, again, these are all results that some of you may remember, that regular languages are close under intersection, but intersection adds succinctness. You pay a price for succinctness. But it turns out that there is a difference here between intersection and conjunction. They're not the same. Look at this example. What does it say? It says X and Y should be connected by both E1 and E2, but this actually says by the intersection. So there must be a word, a path connecting X to Y, that in both in E1 and in E2. Well, the conjunction say, no, I want an E1 path between X and Y and a separate E2 path between X and Y. So at the logical level, conjunction and intersection are not the same, and therefore we may want to close this language both under union and under conjunction. And this leads to this more complicated language, which is closure under union and conjunction, that's what we call UC, union and conjunction of two-way regular path queries, and you get a more, a more expressive language. And there we are a bit off here on the screen. Okay, so I can try to find a relationship between two nuts in the same wing using this query. And again, you want to know, do you have a decidable containment, and here it's more difficult because database techniques cannot, cannot handle transitive closure, and automata theoretic techniques uh, cannot, handle, uh, uh, cannot handle the conjunction, and you have to combine them, and now you, you can show still that it's decidable, but we went from polynomial space to exponential space. But still, we got a class of queries that is not very natural because we have closure under disjunction, which is union and conjunction, transit closure, but we don't have closure under trans... <coughs> if you look at what we close the language in, we only close it under disjunction and conjunction. We could not take, like this relationship, which is x, y, live on a triangle, and then take the transitive closure of that. And then would mean that we have a, a, natu a natural language, because the natural language you want to be closed under all of its operations. You don't want to be closed under only one operation, not under another operation. If you look at, at SQL, SQL is closed under all of its operation. And that's what you want here. And so this was a major open problem for several years. And only this year, finally, uh, together with, with two Chilean uh, computer scientists, we were able to show that it's decidable, but it is now in doubly exponential space. So it's a nice theoretical result. Is it practical? Not clear. And I'll come back to this issue of worse's complexity. But you saw that this is very much a result about big data databases today. This is a result about no SQL data. What kind of core optimization can you do but no SQL databases? 
And it's very much built on, on, the, on the foundation that we have built for it in database theory and in automata theory. Now, so the question that arises here is how much attention should we pay to worst case complexity result like double exponential space? So now I'm going to completely switch topics and I'm going to talk about uh, Boolean logic. And Boolean logic uh, arose in the middle of the 19th century where George Bull realized you can deal with logic. Logic at this point existed for almost 2,500 years. It started with Aristotle in the 4th century BC. But Bull realized that you can deal with logic algebraically because you can take conjunction, you can think of it as a product operation. And you can take this junction and think of it as an as a addition operation. So now in analogy to, do, to algebra that we have like in fields, you have plus and times. Now you have Boolean algebra where the, where the operations are conjunction and disjunction. And from this we got a mo very modern problem, the Boolean satisfiability problem. And so in the Boolean satisfiability problem, we have an expression from and, or, and nots. And the question is, can we assign zero and one to the Boolean variables and make the whole thing come to be one? So this is an example. I wrote you here one example. It's a small example. Here if you assign x1 and x2 to be zero, and x3 and x4 to be one, the whole thing comes to be, two, come to, comes to be uh, one. You can evaluate it and check. But what happens if you don't have four variables, but if you have 40 or 4,000 or maybe 400,000 variables, then it, it becomes very challenging. How do we actually find if this is satisfiable or not? In fact, all of the 19th century, people realized that this is a difficult problem. So William Stanley Jevons, who followed Bull, wrote, I have given much attention, therefore, to lessening both the manual and the mental labor of the process, the process Boolean reasoning. And I shall describe several devices which may be adopted for saving trouble and risk of mistake. So Jevons described the first what they call logic machine, a machine completely constructed for moving wooden pieces that can solve Boolean reasoning with four variables, okay? Couldn't handle more than four variables. Ernest Schroeder, who again a bit later write, getting a handle on the consequences of any premises, or at least the fastest method for obtaining these consequences, seems to me to be one of the noblest, if not the ultimate goal of mathematics and logic. Because here there's no good method other than exhaustive search to do Boolean reasoning. And this became finally formalized in the early 70s when Steve Cook and apparently Leonid Levin proved the Boolean satisfiability is NP-complete. And that's how the whole NP-complete theory that, uh, that is the, much of the foundation of complex, modern complex theory. Now at the same time, people already very early on started trying to build systems to do Boolean reasoning. So remember, the ENIAC is turned on in 1946, and the immediate uses were military, and then some scientific and business, but all of them in the mid-50s, Noel, Shaw, and Simon built a program they call Logic Theorist, and they go to Principia Mathematica of, of uh, uh, Russell and, uh, and, and Whitehead, and they are able to prove all the propositional logic theorem from the book. They are very, very proud of themselves. And in 1950, the National Security Agency, NSA, I want to know that if they are listening right now, I'm, I'm giving them credit. So the NSA commissioned a report by Davis and Putnam on computational method in propositional logic. And so there was a, a, a few papers in the early, late 50s, early 60s, and they established a method which became known as the DPLL method, which is simply is a, is a backtracking search with a very small number of heuristics. And that seems very modest progress. And for years, only a very small community really worked on this because it seemed pretty much hopeless. You know, it's be complete. What can you hope to do? But some people didn't give up and kept throwing heuristic at the problem. And so. By now, what we have is something that build on, builds on DPLL, but it's called now CDCL, a conflict-driven closed learning, a huge set of heuristics. I'm just writing here a small set of heuristics here. And these heuristics are, have been enough 
that today we solve industrial problems with millions of variables. Just to show you how impressive the progress has been, so this is, this is a, a colleague of mine, Sanjit Sesha in Berkeley. In 2012, he took a bunch of solvers between 2000 and 2012, but he ran them on the same benchmark on the same machine, just to compare between them. And what he showed is that in the solver from 2000 took about 500 seconds, and the, the, the solver of 2012 took one second. So we saw over, over a period of 12 years, we saw 500x improvement in, in propositional satisfiability solving. And this, this is still continuing. And people are talking about Moore's law for such solvers because the, 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 the progress is so impressive and nobody can explain it. And as a result today, if you go, for example, to Microsoft, you find that people use such solver, not only in Microsoft research, but in Microsoft software development, such solvers are being used on a daily basis for all kinds of software engineering tasks. This has become just a completely routine part of software development. So this leads us to the whole issue of how can we use such solving in, in software uh, uh, validation. And just to understand the importance of this, if you look today at the IT industry overall, uh, worldwide, it's about a... Uh, three quarters of trillion dollars per year. It's a huge industry. It's a huge part of the, of the world industry. And a, a major issue is what's called functional verification. How do we verify the system we built meet their desired intent? They do what, what we want them to do. And if, when you look to that, any serious development effort, you'll find that when you quantify it, the majority of the development effort is dedicated to verification. I mean, the estimates are around 70 to 80% is all verification. So this is a huge problem. Now, in the academic community, we like very much to talk about, about formal verification, where we build mathematical models and we analyze them mathematically and we use model checker and theorem prover or what have you. But when you actually go do an analysis of how much of the industrial practice is formal verification, is at most 10%. So what is really people do to verify system? It's called what, dynamic testing. Dynamic verification is a, nice, is a nice term for the word. Testing, you simulate the system under different testing scenarios, and you check the result against the expectations. And this is at least 90% of the effort goes that way. So dynamic verification is the dominant approach. You simulate the design with input test vectors. You compare them against the, the intended result. And that's how you check the system perform as it's supposed to perform. And the problem that you have there is the, the input space is exceedingly large. For example, you may still remember the, the floating point uh, division, the buckle of Intel with the Pentium, where Intel issued the Pentium and the Pentium did not, could not divide floating point numbers correctly. And so imagine that you want to, you don't want, you're the manager, and you don't want this to happen again. And you have a, today, a, let's say, dividing, a divider on, on the chip with 128 uh, bits, floating point numbers. So one way is you say, let's just simply check all possibilities, but then you have, uh, you need to deal with 256 possibilities and the sun will go nova before you're done, okay? Even if you can do, the fastest possible computer cannot do it. Even if you cover the planet with computers, you still cannot do it. Even if you can run every cycle in one Planck constant, you still cannot do it. So what do people do? So the classical approach for many years was you, you hire people and their job is to write test cases. They will sit down and they will look at the specification and they will think of all kinds of scenarios and they will write test cases. But writing test cases is like writing code. As you know, pretty much a, a, a software engineer can write about 20 lines of code per day regardless of the language in which he, she or he is writing. The same thing is true for test cases. So you can have a thousand test engineers, and they will write only 20,000 per day. This is a small number. You can simulate it in under one second. So this is nothing. We want to be able to, to, to generate many, many billions of test cases. So the modern approach of this is called random constraint test generation. And what you do instead, the test engineers do not write uh, uh, testing scenarios by writing explicit scenario. They write constraints to describe the scenario. For example, they want 
both a, a divided and divisor to be very large or very small, or one very large and one very small. So you write constraints. And then you use constraint solver to get solutions. So you, you, it's an indirect approach, but it's been proposed by three people at IBM in the mid-90s, and today this is de facto industry standards, random constraint. And whether, why do we call it random constraint? We call it random constraint because we don't want to generate only one solution, we want many solutions. And we don't want to depend on the specifics of the solver or the internal structure of the solver. So we want the solution to be random. And furthermore, we know nothing about the input space. So we want it to be uniformly at random. So this is now the problem that we want to deal with. We want to generate solutions, let's say such, such solutions, we can translate the constraints to, to, to such, such formulas, but we want the solution to be uniformly at random and we want to solve large, large problems. And this is a challenging problem. So this is uniform generation of such solutions, random and uniform. So you take as a given that you have a such solver. How do you randomize? Turns out people try to go, you go, and you randomize some decision by the SAT solvers. That gives you very, very poor coverage. That gives you something that's not really random, it's not really uniform. So um, turns out that this problem has application way beyond just random consent verification. It has, for example, everybody now talks about MOOCs where you have 100,000 students and you have a huge problem of cheating because one student solved solve the final solution, post it on some bulletin board, everybody can copy. So what you need is every student to get a different assignment, a different problem. I can, and you have 100,000 students. So the only way you do it is define templates for the problem and then generate problems randomly and uniformly again. And uh, this is also a, a major application is probabilistic inference in machine learning. Okay, you have some information and you want to sample after conditioning. So this is a very fundamental problem in computer science, even though we, we arrived at it purely from verification. So the theory, the theoreticians have already studied the problem extensively in the 80s and the 90s. From their point of view, they were done. They described beautiful algorithms, published papers, and they moved on. And a few years ago, I decided together with the students to look into this, and we took the state of the art algorithm and we implemented it. We means he implemented it. And uh, we were able to go to 16 variables. We, even at 17, it already blew up. And I remember telling him, you know, 16, I'm sorry to tell you, we cannot publish it. People will simply laugh at us if we send a paper, we say we implemented it for n equals 16. I said, we have to be able to do better than that. So we went and started looking, what do people in, in the industry do? And it turned out that people in the industry use one of two methods. Either they use method that give you really random and uni uniform, and they use binary decision diagrams, doesn't matter what they are, but this don't scale more than about a thousand variables. So up to a thousand variables, it scale, after that it's just too slow. But it gives you very nice uh, uniformity. Or they use techniques for machine learnings, and this is called MCMC, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, but they are too slow. So you have to compromise. Either, either you cut them off uh, uh, before they take the, the rich convergence, but then you don't have good uniformity, or you, or you let them run longer, and then you, you have good uniformity but not good scalability. So it seems that there was no method that can achieve scalability and uniformity. And uh, we were able to take both classical and new techniques in computer science, and now we can scale to 100,000 variables. And we do it by combining two, we, what we run is a, is a randomized algorithm, polynomial time, using a SAT oracle. Universal hashing is a very classical technique in computer science. SMT solving is a very new technique in computer science. But this combination allows us to scale to industrial size problems. And, uh, but we have to compromise. We can do it uniformly. uniformly. We do it almost uniformly. And what does almost uniformly mean? So if you have a formula phi, and this is the solution space, and the size of the solution space is kappa, then uniformity means that every output should occur with probability one over kappa. That's uniformity. That's very difficult to get. Instead, 
we take a parameter epsilon, and we want every output to come with a probability which is one over kappa times one plus epsilon, or the divided by one plus epsilon. So you can become as accurate as you want by taking epsilon to be as small as you want, but of course you'll pay the price because the method is, is a polynomial in uh, one over epsilon. So if you take a very small epsilon, you pay the price. The, the idea of universal hashing, or the idea that we're going to use, is we're going to take the solution space and partition it into many, many cells. And the cells have to be relatively small and relatively of equal size. And then we choose a cell, the cell contains some solution, but if the number is small enough, we can enumerate the solutions. Usually we get a few dozen solutions in a cell. We enumerate them, and then we can choose randomly one of them. We choose a random cell, a random solution in a cell, and it comes up uh, almost uniformly. But now we take a space that we know nothing about, the space of solution of a set of constraints, and we have to partition it almost equally. How do we do it? Beautiful classical in computer science, universal hashing. So what is the idea in a hashing? So if you remember, hashing is simply taking a large space and mapping it into some smaller space. You can think of it mapping some n-bit vectors to m-bit vectors, so m is quite smaller than n. Now, if the inputs are random, then you can look for a function that will give you a ni nice partition in expectation. But when you don't know nothing about the input, how can you do it? The answer is, this is the idea due to uh, Carter and Wegman, is you, you, you have a family of what's called universal family of hash function. You choose a function at random. And, and the function are randomized over the inputs. Even though you know nothing about the inputs, if the function is random, it will randomize well, and you'll get roughly equal cells. Fantastic idea. And how do we actually do it? Turns out to be fairly simple. We, we take the initial constraints and we add to them random extra constraints. What is a random extra constraint? We take a, we choose each variable with probability half, we XOR them, and we equate them to zero or, or one. What is this? This is really a linear equation. Simply we're looking now at this variable at the Boolean field. And this is a linear equation. It means we take the space of solutions and we cut it with a random hyperplane. And that cut it roughly at half. If you do it enough times, you'll get small enough cells of roughly equal size. But now we get constraints that combine normal, normal clauses, what we call CNF, conjunctive normal form, with these extra constraints. And such solvers do not handle this well. So if I give a such solver, standard CNF formula plus extra constraints, standard SAT solvers will not do well. But there is a now a technology called SMT, which is a satisfiability modulo theory, which has emerged in the last 15 years. And they take satisfiability solving plus some additional theory, for example, linear, linear uh, equalities or linear inequalities. And they, in a very smart way, combine Boolean reasoning with the, this other theory reasoning. In our case, we need to combine Boolean reasoning, which is the, the standard such solving, with linear equations over Boolean variables, for which we can use Gaussian elimination. And the such solver, we use a, a something called crypto mini -SAT, and it's really specialized for that, and it solves this problem very efficiently. So what do we get? So we get just how uniform are we? So we took a problem with 16,000 solutions, and we generated millions of samples. And then we compare the distribution of, of, of this almost uniform sampling to real uniform sampling, because when you have 16,000 solutions and you know them, you can generate them uniformly. And as you can see from this distribution, the results are indistinguishable. So even though we use epsilon, which is, which is about, I think, 0.75, because otherwise it's too expensive, we still get distribution that is just indistinguishable from the uni uniform distribution. And in terms of scalability, we compare it against the best other sampler that was out there, this is a couple of years ago, a best, uh, uh, that came from the AI community, it was called Exo Sample Prime, which gave no uniformity guarantee, and in fact gave very poor uniformity, and we were still faster by two or three orders of magnitude. 
and we are now fast enough that there is actually industrial interest in adopting these techniques for industrial tools. So this really raises the questions of uh, we need to scratch our head about the whole concept of NP completeness. So when I was a, a graduate student, and then NP completeness was a scary problem. You know, it was dangerous even to look at it. Once you prove that it's NP complete, you, you definitely do not want to do anything about it because it's utterly hopeless. And indeed, I'm not trying to say that NP completeness is meaningless. We know today we can generate synthetic SAT problems that are very, very difficult. But the industrial problems, for some reason that we do not fully understand, tend to be rather easy. We can solve huge industrial problems with millions of variables. So complexity theory today does not really give us good guidance between, good distinction between what is easy and what is hard. If you say NP complete, it may mean hard, it may not mean it. We really don't have a good theory to make this distinction. And, the, and so this raised, in my opinion, two questions. Now, suddenly, start solving it. This is a huge hammer. We can solve large, complex problems. I show you how we can use it for sampling. What else can we do with it? Turns out we can do counting. What else can we do with it? But more, more fundamentally, for many years, complexity theory relied on one very good measure, which was worst case complexity. Turn out it's too pessimistic. What else should we use? It's just too pessimistic. So this leads me to the conclusion for model-driven science to data-driven computer science and back. So I don't think we have a paradigm shift yet. With, with all due respect to our own hype. I think we have a paradigm glide. The field is evolving. Every scientific field, every technical field should be evolving. What, I've, what I tried to give you two examples where the data-driven approach refines and builds on the model-driven approach. It does not replace it completely. If you go to see, go to your colleague in the physics department, ask them, well, you know, Newtonian mechanics is passé. Now it's all about string theory and quantum loop gravity. You say no. They say no. What do you do in the first year? You teach the mechanics and you teach them electromagnetism. You teach them optics. This is the foundation of physics. It was when I was a student in physics and it is still today. And I think we should take a deep breath before we go and throw away all the, all the old stuff and put new stuff. The curriculum needs to be revised. But if you if you cannot do graph, uh, 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 graph algorithms, you're not going to be able to do any kind of, uh, let's say, Bayesian networks, which are developed based on graph algorithms. So we need to be modest in how we shift the field. Shift, change it gradually, but don't not throw away what we think is now old-fashioned computer science. Thank you very much. Before starting the discussion, I would like to thank both speakers for the excellent contributions and their, let's say, overlapping but slightly contradicting views, which we will elaborate in the next minutes. And I would like to ask for questions from the audience. Um, Carlo has raised his hand and there are several others already in the room, so I will forward it to you. A very exciting start. Thanks. Um, you know, although I live next door to Stefano uh, and Moshe lives on the other side of the ocean, uh, I must say that I much agree with what uh, Moshe was telling us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I would like to make a few comments on this. Uh, not, not only, you know, uh, NP complete problems, you know, we have been continuing uh, uh, being able to prove that we can solve them in practice, but even undecidable problems. And now we are at the stage in which, you know, we are applying heuristics, we are applying mechanical ways of doing things, and show that in practice, you know, we can reach results that uh, you cannot prove that you, you can solve in general. So th this is definitely a direction in which uh, we are moving in, in many, many areas. And there's two issues that, you know, Stefano was raising as uh, things that, you know, really uh, 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 indicate a paradigm shift. And I'm not sure they are. 
you, you mentioned, you know, the way we reward science. I think that in all computer science, we are changing the way we are thinking about the way we reward scientific work. Not only papers, but artifacts, reproducibility of results. We are not just checking that the paper you're presenting is okay, but we want to see the tool that you have developed. Uh, you know, we want to make your approach reproducible. And this is not only true, you know, in, in the case of the big data scientists. I mean, it, it's a general uh, attitude that is becoming more and more, uh, you know, part of our discipline. The second comment, you know, you mentioned your experience, you know, in the... Uh, in this, uh, you know, Scuola Politecnica and, and other cases. But isn't this the case that you are basing your best students on, at the end of an education that actually has been built on the traditional principles? So I, I, I'm very much, you know, in favor of this problem-oriented, uh, deep analysis that you do at the end, but, it, you know, it, in my opinion, it can't be disjoint by you know, stressing the foundations uh, of our discipline. Can I defend? Thank you. So, first of all, I don't think that uh, uh, we took very different angles, but I don't think that we are too far away in the terms of uh, there's not such in, in what, what. So, for instance, when uh, uh, Moshe has been discussing uh, the fact that uh, through data log, it is possible to solve uh, or to, to reformulate and to understand graph problems. It is not very different from what I have been saying that uh, through, let's say, a formal description, you can understand genomic problems. So I, I am not against uh, the fact that we should use uh, our formal description while we are uh, meeting with uh, the other sciences. I think what, what has been mostly different between the discussion that Moshe has uh, presented to us and what I have uh, discussed is that, uh, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, the problems that has been shown by, by Moshe are, are pretty much understood by our community. So, and and I, I, I do agree that uh, they have a practical implication, and I also do agree that uh, uh, we are moving towards uh, a situation where, uh, let's say, uh, NP completeness or the hardness of the problems is, is becoming less important because uh, we know uh, or, or at least is changing the, the, the let's say the, the, uh, the, the our approach to this to this problem. We don't consider them to be hopeless, and I also agree on the fact that we need uh, this vertical uh, uh, stuff. What I'm saying is just uh, be careful. Uh, we 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 should keep to our principle. We should stand, as I said, in our principle. But uh, when, you, when you have to, to, to meet uh, another, uh, another discipline, there's a huge, uh, let's say, effort that has to be done. And, and I have been stressing the fact that uh, for doing this effort, for understanding the other discipline, uh, there are some additional skills that, that you might need. And uh, this, uh, to me, is, uh, I wouldn't say, wouldn't say equally important, comes after, but it is important to stress also in computer science. Uh, uh, two comments. One, I was really very amused to read the goals of the Harvard mas master, uh, master degree in computer science and engineering. Uh, I've been now doing computer science for 30 years. I think this will be a good goal for me to aspire to. And I'm just amused that they think they can do it in on one or two years, this, uh, this list. It's mind-boggling. Show you how marketing gets ahead of reality. But. But you know, I, you know, things are, I agree with Stefano that, that this we look, we look. They are, they are, the approaches are not the, dif the different sometimes. Take for example the problem-based approach. So to me, it's a it's a pedagogical issue. So we have taken our intro course and we've changed it into a problem-based course. And what it means is that instead of coming starting with the students and we are going to show them, well, here are the set of principles which we're going to teach you. I told them, here are a list of cool problems. For example, here is a, the graph. Here is the, we have the email corpus from Enron. You may remember the Enron scandal was right in Houston. The email corpus are public. So you can take the email corpus and you construct the graph, who sends email to whom. And now you can try to use a, like a page rank to figure out who makes the decision in that company. So now you end up teaching them a graph 
is this, a little bit of linear algebra, eigenvalues, a lot of stuff is being taught, and they're teaching it on a way to solving a cool problem instead of starting from the principle. So to me, and actually it's very successful uh, with the students, in particular, it seems to be very much more successful with uh, female students. So we've been able to raise the female participation, which is a huge issue for us, from about, we've been able over five years to, to double it by taking many measures, but including teaching the course in what we consider a more student-friendly way. But still, we have a set of, a set of things that we, we know we want to teach them, but we're doing it in, in a more pedagogically uh, astute way. So I, I really don't see a difference. It's not as if principles don't matter, all you have are problems. Problems can be a way to get at the principles. Before going to the next question, I have seen some slight differences before you agree on everything. Uh, isn't there an ontological difference? Because, Moshe, you are assuming somehow an ontological structured view, whereas Stefano was pointing out that he is taking data with no view, with no structure at all, and he tries to find some, some structure. Or take, for example, text mining, where you look to identify concepts and you don't know anything about the text, and you have some means to learn concepts out of text. So there is some difference, and I would not like to let you out on that. But, but what we have tried to do is, first of all, take the structure and, and make it a very minimalist structure. We say just, it's a graph. It's a graph with labels. It, it is assuming something. I would say is that... Uh, even when you have strings, you assume a structure because you have one letter coming after the next one, right? It's not a collection of letters. There's always some structure. No structure, we can do very little. The question is how much structure do you want to have and how flexible is the structure? So, as we know, all of mathematics can be built on set theory, right? You need a very minimalist structure, but you need it. So, but I was also trying to show that we solve the, we solve the new problems using very classical tools. It's part, you know, some people are saying, for example, oh, formal language theory, automata theory, we don't need it anymore. These are all the old models. And I still find these tools are incredibly heavily used in industry today. Many of the people who advocate it don't realize what happened in industrial practice. Yeah, maybe the difference in approach is that I, I see uh, lots of problems before you come to the uh, formalization. So once it is formalized, it is uh, then uh, uh, very relatively uh, I'd say straightforward, quote unquote, to use our uh, skills. And the question is how to formalize. And, and to me, this is the, it's particularly when you're talking about uh, data science and you're talking to, uh, I'd say, uh, um, people who really believe that uh, it is possible to do data science uh, uh, omitting the principle of causality and just by looking at the data and, 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 get, and, and deriving knowledge from it. Well, it creates a lot of problems. I think we have to be mature enough to say, no, this is not the right way to go, but uh, to also to be convincing somehow to explain uh, the, the way in which uh, instead we should go to the formalization and then once we go to the formalization, be able to use our, our let's say, um, abilities. So why they, 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 they risk to remain uh, unused by, by um, let's say, for, for many applications of data science. I want also to make a remark. It is true that we as, data, as, as, as a community are going toward this effort of repeatability and so on, but I learned from the biologists that they really want to see a system, they want to have the link to the system that you are publishing about, because otherwise your, your, uh, your uh, paper doesn't, doesn't, is not accepted. Or they want to see the, the data. You have to essentially publish the data. So there are uh, communities where this effort is, is being taken to a much, uh, let's say, further uh, level, and I think we should uh, appreciate that. I just want to make a comment on this. Uh, we don't have to worry about model correlation is good enough. I mean, this is, you know, buying into the hype of Wired magazine is a very dangerous thing to do because it leads to really enormously wrong conclusion. For example, we have now a huge situation in the United States with, and also I'm assuming probably in Europe as well, it had to do with employability of people. So one data that everybody shows is that the distinction in lifetime income between the people who are high school graduates and the people who are college graduates. And you can see the difference is in, is in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the conclusion is everybody should go to college. But of course, Going to college is a filter that there's underlying a capability that they distinguish between people. So if the solution is, okay, everybody will go to college and we'll close the income gap. Of course, it's a stupid conclusion 
because you just look at correlation and you're looking not to look at the causal model. So, I mean, to me, this is this complete fallacy. The idea is we don't need to look at causality. Next question from the audience. Yeah, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to ask, but I just want to... Satisfiability and MP. I don't believe that satisfiability that SAT solvers are the answer to MP completeness, because I believe that because I heard you talk five years ago where you already said that. Not, not as I mean now, of course, we have progress, and you mentioned this. To this microphone, uh, we got we work together with Siemens Austria here on some real problems. And they have problems with railway, with railway networks. Uh, there's a problem uh, called partners' units problem. And so I was very happy and said, OK, let's apply a set solver. They only have 50 variables or 60 variables. And maybe. Yeah, that's. Yes. I don't hear you. Sorry, I don't hear you. <laughs> there's one variable I know. This is the zero one here, yeah? Uh, but it's out of my control, unfortunately. So I was really, really disappointed by how badly set solvers work on this. So I don't believe the propaganda about set solvers. They may be good in some areas like verification, but I think it's a huge propaganda that they are making. And as soon as you look at really concrete problems of the industry, many of these, I don't say all, can just not be solved with set solver. So I don't believe it, and I can give you this problem. We have published it, and no set solver can solve it. It's an MP hard problem. Now you may say it's very, it's in a very. Thank you for this. Thank you for switching me off. It's in some, <laughs> it's in some spot, yeah, which is hard, maybe or not. But it says something about NP that we can still find a lot of in industrial problems because in the meanwhile I have heard about others that cannot be solved with SAT solvers. And I think it's a huge propaganda that SAT solvers have just solved MP and we don't have to worry about this. But Georg, I think we're in violent agreement. What I said is that it's very easy to build, to synthesize a, a SAT problem with hundreds of variables that we cannot solve them. And at the same time, huge problems are easy. And we do not have, by each the issue is, we do not have any theory that explain to us which problems, which sub problems are hard, and which sub problems are easy. With? That's not a good explanation, we know that. It's one explanation, but it doesn't explain everything. So it's a, very, it's a very active research area to understand, but classical complexity theory does not give us this guidance. Excuse me, excuse me, Gear. Can, 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 can we close down the SAT, prova, SAT solver? Because I think it's a very specific topic in the discussion between, between those two approaches. And I would like to give the floor to a last question. Sorry for that. And I would like to, sorry. Yeah, Simone Martini, Bologna, Italy. Now, I, I liked very much the, 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 the expression para, paradigm shift that, 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 that you used, uh, glide that, that you used. And, and I'd like to, uh, to, to argument a bit on this. Now, um, for decades, we imagined ourselves uh, in a citadel of discrete methods inside a vast land of continuous models. That mathematics, physics, even chemistry, right? And um, in, in this citadel, we, uh, we, we, we succeeded in having fantastic uh, su 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 success. Uh, we revitalized uh, fields in mathematical logic. We provided uh, uh, hierarchies of, of the description of our models, which, which are effective, and they scale at different level of abstraction, as opposed to continuous models, that, um, um, differential equations. They do not scale. They are not effective, and so on and so forth. But I think that what Stefano, uh, Stefano um, uh, showed us, it, it means that we should at, at least open the citadel. We need 
to be more exposed to continuous mathematics, to continuous models, to statistical uh, thinking and statistical, um, 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 I mean, statistical, statistical methods. It's, n it's, not, it's not only a problem of, of teaching, it's a problem of the identity, of the epistemology of our, of our, of our discipline. And the, with the hope to provide for those methods, for those, for those techniques, the same way of uh, revitalizing some some small portion that we th then with the same success that that, that we that we had in the, in discrete methods. Well, I I substantially agree. So it's very very quick, very short. I I do believe that uh, by uh, giving uh, attention to statistics uh, to disciplines which somehow can bring us. Uh, the ability to, to reason, uh, in, let's say, in a more, uh, let's say, f foundational way to, uh, uh, say, uh, to, to the data science problems, we will create uh, uh, more valuable uh, scientists uh, for, for, our, for, our, uh, for our future. I agree. So, I actually also agree. I think the challenge for us is, uh, is, the, is the curriculum. Especially here, you know, you've, you've gone from the Bologna thing, gone from what used to be in many places five-year education to three-year education. And as the more mature, it's become much more difficult to do in three years to give someone really technical maturity. If you look what happened, if you are, let's say, you study physics, and you have a bachelor degree in physics, everybody understands that this is, you're not a, a practicing physicist. You have an undergraduate degree, you need at least if you have a, a bachelor degree in physics, you may go to get a master's degree in some engineering field or in applied physics, but you're not a practicing physicist by getting a bachelor degree. I think we would have, in my opinion, at some point to conclusion that especially because we need some of the, from the old classical methods, we need to teach more uh, the, the, the big data type of algorithm. People are saying that machine learning needs to be part of our algorithm scores. We need to have more exposure to, to probabilistic techniques and statistical technique, more exposure to continuous, continuous mathematics because we want people who are going to, to go and work with people in, in other engineering areas. I don't see how you can do it all in three years. I just don't see how you can do it. And I think at some point we'll have to go back to that, that the bachelor degree in computer science is just a general education. And if you want to be a practicing computer scientist, you need to have at least a master's degree to essentially Going back to the almost the old system, the, the pre-Bologna system, it takes a, a five-year degree to be a practicing engineer. Uh, thank you for this call for the pre-Bologna system. Um, I would like to thank both speakers for the excellent presentations. Give them a hand. Thank you. You can have a look at the slides, uh, which will be online, and there will be this contribution in this book, which will be a form of proceedings of this conference. Thank you again, and we have break up to a quarter to 12, okay? Coffee break, thank you.